Morning. How many of you are awake? Hands up. How many of you played with Backtrack yesterday? How many have it installed? Do we have at least 20 people? Excellent. So, um, before I start my talk, if you may remember, yesterday we got to this point where you guys installed bu uh, Backtrack and were about to hack an Elastics box, right? We were just about to get there. You just didn't get there, unfortunately. So what we're going to do is following this session, we'll have the hack session. Now, I've already set up for all of you. Check it out. You have 29 Elastic servers ready to be hacked. No, here are the IP addresses. Right, that is true. What is the Wi-Fi SSID, please? It's Astri Dev something. Or Astricon Lab or something like that. Uh, it will give you a DHCP address, so we'll do this later on. Uh, we'll be bringing in another projector to have it screened here, so we'll be able, able to see what people are doing. And no, we're not going to show backtrack. We're going to show the results of what you do on backtrack on a specific server. So we have one server on the screen, and I want all of you to start hitting it. Now, I'd like to thank Jared and Bluehost for bringing that box, which is, by the way, awesome. I need to get one of those back home. I have no idea where to, but it's awesome. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. If it would, well, it fits in my luggage, but then everything else won't fit. <laughs> no, it won't. No, they'll, no, they won't. Trust me. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's start. So session is called CSI VoIP, uh, analyzing a, a PBX fraud, or who the... Where should I point my finger? Who am I to blame for losing $400,000 worth of cash in a weekend. By the way, I've seen that happen. Uh, just a little administration. What you're about to see is highly technical, which means that we're going to go through it. If you're not technical enough or you don't have knowledge what Apache is, who knows what Apache is? Hands up. Ever gone through Varlog messages? Varlog audit? Good. IP tables? Gray log? I said gray log, not syslog. One person, good. Okay, so it's highly technical, and it means that it will be in a rapid process, in rapid pace. So keep in mind that. Try right, to keep up. If you have a question, raise your hand. That means stop me if you don't understand something. And I will be available later on, so no big deal there. Uh, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Neil. What I do is, people ask me, what do you do with Asmus? My answer is yes. That's my answer. I do everything with asterisk. I've been cracking at the keyboard since 1985, which means I'm old school. And cracking at asterisk since 2002, which means I'm a dinosaur. But that's something else. Uh, this is not CSI VoIP. This is the result of CSI VoIP. I don't know if any of you heard about the various crackdowns on fraudsters. There was a team in Romania hacking PBX systems over a period of three and a half years. $6.1 million. You know how much money that is in Romania? <whistles> That's a shitload of Ferraris. Trust me. This is more like CSI VoIP. These guys more look, more, look more or less like we do. Pseudo. So what we're going to go over is, A, here are the steps. Get the primary evidence. Normally, these will be your CDR records. These are your, this is your proof that something happened. Now, if your hacker is good, he will delete those. I've seen that happen. Okay? Uh, try to extrapolate what device or extension got hacked and how it was hacked. Normally, that information will be available from the CDR. Eliminate possible candidates. Any investigation is a procedure of elimination. Have anybody seen Sherlock Holmes? Same process. Eliminate what's available. Examining log files, we'll go over that. Try to recreate the hack. Now, this is a very important step. Now, 
in most of our investigations, we've encountered normal vulnerabilities that were out there in the wild. We knew what they were. Sometimes we've seen something completely new and we tried recreating it. The recreation part, if you're able to do it, is the most important one. Why? A, you will learn from it. B, make sure you tell everybody. And I do mean make sure. Publicize it. Of course, fix and protect if you can. There are situations where fix and protect are not your friends because simply do, you can't do that. So let's talk about primary evidence. Up to now, everybody with me? Yay. Okay, so primary evidence. Let's be completely honest about what fraudsters or PBX hackers do. They don't give a rat's ass about covering their track. They come in, they hit you for $10,000, and they go away. Why don't they care about covering their ass? Very simple, because the chances of any of you finding who they are are nil, zero, zip. Just so you'll know. <coughs> Sorry. Um, They leave a lot of garbage, that's what I mean. They just leave the garbage around. Exactly. Yeah, that is true. Um, in some rare cases, the hacker will, re will remove the CDR records. So my advice to you is store the, your CDR records in more than one location. You can do that. For example, on asterisk. CDR MySQL, then CDR Custom, then CDR CSV, and maybe copy it also to somewhere else in the same time. And if you can redirect syslog over to an R syslog server or a, or a gray log server to just have those in there, that would be beautiful. If no CDR records are found, we're in a whole new ballgame now. Whole new ballgame, because if I don't know what happened and where it happened from, I don't even have the initial trail of where to start investigating what happened. And I need to investigate anything on the system. At that point, when this happens, if you don't have that link, that thread, my advice, advice to you is take a new, a, a blank hard drive, a new CD, and just reinstall the system from scratch and lock it down. Because you don't know what you're dealing with at that point. Okay, so let's take a look at some CDR records. Anybody can tell me what's wrong with this? Just looking at it. Take, well, take a few seconds. Let's, let's, let's try looking at it and say, okay, what is wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> what, what did you think? Share. There is no right or wrong answer. Yeah. The extension where? 900 number, where? Which record? Ah, good. Calls are coming in really rapidly. <coughs> Look at this. This means that extension 200 over here, where is my mouse? Here we go. Extension 200 is making a call like every 10 seconds. Look at this. It's crazy. And the funny bit here is this. Whoops. Sorry for that. My bad. Oops. So extension 200 dialed a 900 number. That's a premium number. Okay. And the previous records show the same extension trying to dial to an 019 number. Now in Israel, 019 is one of the international prefixes. We have about nine of those. In the US, we've got 011, right? In Israel, we got 011, and then 00, then 012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Each one of those is a different operator. Um, so there is definitely something wrong with that. So why is extension 200 making consecutive calls to the same number over and over again. This, this means something funky is going on. Somebody's trying to do something. So 
Step one, rule out a network hack. What does that mean? Check your firewall and validate the following. A, SIP access is allowed from known hosts only. Now I've seen, I know that most of the presentations here said, okay, I allow a certain network, for example, level three. No, level three uses an SBC. Usually they will have one or two or four signaling addresses. Allow those in only, not the entire network. Media, that's a whole bit different ballgame, but signaling only for a certain host. RTP access is allowed generally, but is limited to ports 10,000 to 20,000 or even a lower range. Try to limit that as well. Normally, Astros does RTP between 10,000 and 20,000. For a small office system, even a range between uh, 10,000 to, to 1,100, 11,000 will be more than enough for a small office. Try to limit that gap as much as you can. VPN access from remote networks do not allow access to the PBX. Now, th that's something that most people tend to forget. VPNs, I trust my partner. Do you trust your partner to do your security? The answer is no, but the minute you put a VPN site to site between you and your partner, you've literally said, I trust him to do his job right. If he fucks up, it's in your, in your court. So in this specific case, what did we find out? SIP access was allowed from carrier side only. Sounds reasonable. V RTP access was limited to port 10,000 to 11,000. 11, That's reasonable. VPN access allowed access to everything. It was completely open. So that's something first to go about, okay, that's one entry point, one vector we need to make sure wasn't exploited. Step two, check your routing table. And when I say routing table, there are multiple routing tables in an IP system. Can you name those? Anybody? Anybody not sleeping? <laughs> so we have routing tables at the IP layer and we have routing tables at the voice layer, deciding what goes to which trunk, right? So look for misconfigured prefixes or misplaced wildcards. Wildcards on asterisk are one thing that very few people really understand how they work, specifically if you're using free PBX, right? How it goes about and does that magic of saying, oh, this goes here and this needs to be re rewritten like that. How does it do that? What take precedence? Make sure you under understand that. And look for special services routing. Now, Many times I've seen systems where people go about and put specific services into their routing table. But if they do it with a wild card, you end up with something which is completely unmanageable and untraceable. Very hard to find. So what did the validation in this case give us? Outbound words were configured with wild cards. Okay. We were thinking, well, we normally do that with wild cards, no? How many people have configured an outbound route on FreePBX going underscore capital X dot. Nobody? Come on. Not just because I said everybody now is like, okay, it's wrong. I won't, I won't, be, I'll, I won't raise my hand because I'm gonna look foolish, right? Okay, make sure you lock those down. There are certain rules to how you route, okay? There were no limits on the length of the wildcards. That's automatically an issue because that means that if there is a buffer overflow somewhere or something inside asterisk is misconfigured somewhere else, I may end up with a routing loop inside. And again, calls will go out the way sh they shouldn't. There were no blockage rules for premium services. Block premium services. Now, here's a question. What are premium services? Here in the US, what, what are premium services? What? 0900 numbers. Okay, uh, international prefix, 447, 44845, that is UK, 845 numbers. Is that premium service or not? Who said that? Depends, depends on what? Depends on the carrier. That is a good answer. Why is that? Because 845 in the UK is considered a regional number. Normally it's about 10p, 26, 28, p, 28 cents. Routing from the US. 
Another question, 4479, 791 in the UK. 75 p a minute. Woohoo! But that's a mobile number. That's not a premium number. Got news for you. There is such a thing called IPRN, International Premium Rate Numbers. These are normal routing numbers that you can get all over the world, and you get kickback on those. These are used by mostly fraudsters or TV stations that want to generate cash. Um, improper outbound rules order made a wildcard rule capture all outbound dials. What does that mean? It means that if you misordered your routing rules, they have no meaning whatsoever. It's, it's pointless. It's pointless to have eight or 15 rules and then a wildcard rule above them all and it will just capture everything. It just makes no sense. I, I'm, I'm very much aware that most of this stuff is, you're saying, oh, that's common sense. I don't need to think about that. How many of you have technicians doing the work? Hands up, I wanna see. So we got about, I'd say about 20 different integrators in the room who have technicians. How many of you can vouch for all your technicians saying they don't do these mistakes? Ooh, nobody raised their hands. Gentlemen, you have a problem, don't you? Okay, um, check the extension hacked and validate. Now what does that mean? I, we've seen calls going out from extension 200, which means, okay, extension 200 was exploited. So let's go and see if it has a strong password. If it, is it pointing to the right context inside asterisk? Make sure voicemail doesn't allow to return calls from the app itself. There is a way to do um, call return, an operator, and all kinds of stuff from within the asterisk voicemail app. Misconfiguration of that is, a, a, is one of the biggest pitfalls and hacks in Israel. Seen dozens of those. Uh, make sure the extension has a network limitation. Nobody can register to it from whatever they want. In our case, this was the result. There is no extension 200. There never was. What the? Oh, what happened here? So, call this part reflect and fork. What does that mean? It means look at what you've got. Ever, anybody seen? Uh, anybody watch House? Well, it's, it's it's gone now. But anybody like that show? I love House. There's this point where he sits next to the board and goes and just eliminates everything, and then goes, ah, it's that. So it's exactly the same. It's a differential analysis of all the data that you've got. Review the facts. Network, al network allows access from a VPN network, but that can be understood in some circumstances. I can understand you know, if, if something like that can happen. Wildcards are used in the routing table and the order is wrong. Okay, so somebody goofed off. Calls were made from an extension to one, but extension to one doesn't exist. Okay, at this point, it gets a little weird. What does that mean? That immediately points me into a specific portion of an investigation. It means that something happened beyond the SIP layer, beyond the PBX. And I have to start thinking what really happened. So we have two possible forks. PBX was hacked, extension 200 created, exploited, then removed. Another possible fraud, PBX wasn't hacked, but a remote device was exploited in some manner, causing the fraudulent calls. These are your two possibilities at this point. Now, I'm not saying that these are your only two possibilities. For this specific case, these are. But in your, if you will investigate a different case, other forks may exist. Sometimes two, sometimes four, sometimes 10. Depending on the size of the hack, depending how many extensions were exploited, depending on how many uh, cases inside the system you see. Sorry to tell you boys and girls, you check both. You don't go back and say, okay, this is what I'm gonna check. Mm -mm. You check both. If you have four, you check four. If you have 10, you ha check 10. If at the process of doing one, you've eliminated two others, great but technically you have to go through all of them. 
Any of you ever done cyber forensics in the past? Two people in the room. Two, three people. So you have to go through everything. Fork one, classic investigation. You've taken fork one and you say, okay, I'm gonna, something happened here beyond the PBX. <laughs> something happened here beyond the PBX level. It's at an operating system. It's a service, <coughs> some, sorry, some other service was exploited. At this point, you have to check everything. Apache is your first candidate. Why is Apache your first candidate? Check the Apache logs. Because we're working with web-based applications for management. Maybe they were exploited. Maybe there is a, a cross-site script being uh, able to do in there. Maybe it's an injection. Who knows? Check your log files. SSH, same. Now, SSH is a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. It's, uh, as we much like it and we say it's a secure thing, if your Apache is insecure and there is an injection capable in there or a cross-site script, I've seen systems where SSH was replaced by a different binary with like four different backdoors. Webmin, Plesk, anybody uses those? Who uses Webmin? Why? Use the console, my friend. It is much faster and much better. Okay. <laughs> okay, tell that FTP finger. Whoever hacked the system through finger? Anybody runs finger anymore? Mm. Did, did you know that some of HP's Unix environments can be hacked through finger by using a simple pipe? HPUX. Who knows? Okay. Um, Trojan horses, of course. Trojan horses are, are one of the things, it's very hard to find them uh, simply because they look like something really valid. It's not like that's a this beep Trojan horse process, process. Usually they will replace your SSH and it would look exactly the same. Various rootkits, yeah. Fork two. And this is something that I like. And this is, uh, it's, it's, I, I use the slide in many of my presentations and it's, it's pretty funny because our UK office is right above the Sherlock Holmes Museum on Baker Street, so it's really funny. Uh, so in one of the books, Sherlock Holmes says, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, PBX hacks are kind of funky because the re we all know the result. How it got there can be completely convoluted. I've seen stuff people do. They called the system through this PRI and then dialed an extension, hit hash because it had a dial command an internal dial command with the teak parameter, and then f went into call forwarding, forwarded that extension to a different number, which is a premium number, and then had a dialer call into that extension 60 times. Awesome, no? It took me four hours to understand what I was looking at. Four hours. Face it, we're all lazy. Or should I say, we're not lazy, but the thing is that we're busy. How many of you have uh, marketing people come in every day? We need that feature now. We need that feature yesterday, two days ago, a week ago. Right. How many of you have a, a, a normal feature release policy for your PBX system or your telecommunication systems? Nobody. <laughs> Jared is about to faint. <laughs> Uh, so basically we're, we're busy, we're lazy. So we do the minimum we can to get all these marketing people off our back. Stop bothering us, we have other things to do. While we do that, we kind of neglect the rest. So remotely exploiting a device is very much possible. In fact, we're so lazy that setting up passwords for the pa phone's UI, who set up passwords for phone UIs? Oh, we've got a room of about 50 people and there are, there are Eight souls in the crowd. Wow. Allow direct IP dialing to the IP phone. How many of you disabled that? Same number of people. Okay. Not updating device firmware when required. How many of you do an automatic firmware update? One person in the... In two. Wow. Not enforcing a proper security policy for VoIP devices and endpoints. Anybody has that at all? 
One person. Okay, allow our system to be enumerated at ease. You know, off reject and how many of those? Okay, that's everybody should bring them. Yeah, um, leave our console completely open. How many of you actually gone into asterisk.conf and removed the TTY nine from the console? Yes, Jared, great. You know, you go to console, you alt F nine, and you have the asterisk console. Now the funny bit is that you do exclamation mark, and you've got a shell at root level. Can you add any? Anybody has more to add into these? W yeah. If then you get that specific privilege. Yeah. Normally you're right. But the problem is, and here's here's a problem that I've noticed is that most of the people installing Asterisk and running it, in 95% of the times, don't have an idea what that means. Now the fact that you have a room right now where we have about 80 people here that actually know what Linux is and permissions and so on, that's awesome. But I, 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 I'm promising you that most of the technicians that work for most of the guys that, pick, that raise their hands saying, we're integrators, have no idea what a permission is. Simply because they don't. And if they do, they'll just break it because they'll say, oh, the permissions, well, I'll change it to root. That'll make it work for sure, right? <coughs> Sorry. So examining the device, check for call forwarding. Call forwarding is a wonderful thing. Most phones will enable you to do call forwarding by an API. So you can actually go to a SNOME phone through a web interface, which is, by, by the way, completely insecured, and just tell, call forward all calls to the so-and-so number. It's awesome. Simply awesome. Now, about almost three years ago, I've done a project with Vodafone in the UK where we unify, we tried unifying the interfaces of SNOME, Polycoms, and some other phones. And we, I said, we need to unify the process for call forwarding to go through your Broadsoft system. And they said, sure, why not? And then we actually realized that it's very hard to do that. So they said, okay, let's do it through the phone. But then it's not reflected somewhere else, so nobody knows the call isn't call forwarding. And it was on the public internet. So you have phones on the public internet with, a, with an open API that goes call forward. Wow, I can see the millions I'm going to make on that. Check the received calls log. And the, here's something really interesting. You can use SIP Vicious and other SIP tools to actually attack the phone itself. Now, it's not an attack in itself because the phone will barely just ring. So you go, bleep, 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 bleep. but your calls log will have a missed call number. Most people will just pick up the phone, regardless if they know, they know the number or not, and will just call it back, just like that. Now, let's say I have a, the public internet, and I'll now start sending my SIP vicious around the wild with an 0900 number, and I'm going to attack only U.S. only U.S. Uh, networks. How many calls will I get to my 0900 number? That's a few million calls, right? We're going to clear out in like two days, right? Man, if we would have been, if we wanted to be bad, we could have made millions. Uh, check your admin log. Some phones, phones that are of high end and really know their stuff, usually have some kind of administration log showing exactly what happened when. For example, SNOME has that. Um, I know Astra's has have something like that. I didn't see that on Polycom or Yeelink or Grandstream, unfortunately. Um, what can we do? The only thing we can do is go bash them and say, we want that. They won't like it. It will make their device cost more because now they need an NVRAM in there. Always remember the following, when you're investigating or whenever you're setting up a system. Your phones preferably should be on a non-internet enabled network. That means everybody says, okay, put it on a VLAN. If it's connected to the internet, it is all automatically can be exploited in some manner. A Trojan horse, somebody comes in with a computer, somebody installs some obscure hardware on your, on your network which you hadn't seen. You'll never know. 
make sure if that network is for voice over IP only, phones should have no internet. If you don't have a choice and you have to share your internet access with your IP phones, then IP phones should not have a default gateway. If they don't have a default gateway, they cannot get on the internet. It's as simple as that. The tricks are very simple when you think about it. You say, okay, just makes perfect sense. Why, didn't, why haven't I done it till today? It makes perfect sense. Simply because you didn't, you, know, you didn't see it at that point. Use automatic provisioning. Automatic provisioning is awesome. But make sure your automatic provisioning server is secured. Don't put it some, somewhere on EC2 without any access list or anything and hope for it. It'll, it will be okay for the next three hours at most if it's not protected. Always provision a UI password, always. Most phones that have an API, the UI password is also the password for the API. Make sure you provision it, make sure you use it. If you don't, you're gonna run into trouble. If you're connecting via the internet, God forbid, use TLS and SRTP. At least use TLS, at least use TLS, just to make sure that you're coming in right. Questions up till now? Hmm. Okay. Anybody? Okay, yeah. How often do you just leave phones out on the public internet? I'm, I'm not, I'm, would, you li would you like me to run NMAP? <laughs> is that, seriously? Because that just boggles my mind. I don't yeah, it boggles your mind. Okay, I can tell you that... Um, okay. One of the sources for most uh, of the PBX uh, hacks that happen in Israel, well, it is my origin, what can I do? And this is my stomping ground. It, it's quite interesting, but most of the hacks come from the Palestinian Authority. Now, at some point I decided to say, okay, I'm gonna run Sipvicious, and I'm gonna seek IP phones on the subnets of the Palestinian Authority. So I took one of the classes owned by Paltel, which have, uh, they have 32 uh, Class B networks, sorry, 32 Class C networks, one of their ranges, and I said, I let Savicious run on that. I found about 6,000 phones. What? You're nodding your head in disagreement or nodding your head because it's, it's crazy? Yes, but what can we do? Uh, here's a different question. If I'll run the same test on the Comcast IP network, how many phones will I find? Thousands. Vonage, Vitality, uh, IDT, net to phone you name it. What do you think? Phones, just phones out there in the wild. Yes. Yeah. You don't have extension 200 set up. I don't understand how a call could be coming through extension 200. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So first of all, what, um, what happened in this specific case was that A, Apache was basically back then one of the uh, services running off the web server was, was hacked. They got access over to the free PBX, created extension 200 because that was logged. We can actually see it, we, we saw it registering. That system was connected to a gray log and every time somebody registered, a gray log server just said, okay, here's somebody registered. We saw the registration, we saw where it's registering from. And that specific was, it was from, uh, from the Philippines. Yes. And by the way, um, he's going to go ahead and set up the projector so we can save some time. Oh, okay. So for those of you who are dying for a break, you probably won't have time for questions. But if you want to ask the questions... We're going to be here at least 45 minutes more. Okay, no yeah, 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 but uh, okay. just to keep things rolling. Uh, Randy, here we go. hold on one second. Uh, gonna... Yeah. Somebody asked how about phones on the public internet. This is the showdown I was talking about yesterday. Right. Okay, I did a search for the word polycom. 20,750, okay? <laughs> and you'll notice, Polycom Soundpoint, IP phone. Here's the 
address, 216. Okay? Physically on the internet, found in three seconds from the time the question was asked. Took me longer to walk over and plug it in than to run the... The, the trouble is nobody can hear you, so I was way back there. Okay. Three <laughs> seconds to do the query from the time it was asked to here. It took me longer to walk over and plug in than to find 20,000 polycom phones on the public network. You know, let's try something a bit more... Snowm had a few at uh, last. Maybe, let's do this. Grand Street. Of course. Just to enter. Search, let's see what we get. Okay. And a second, I'm a little further from the internet because it was me, outside. Me, 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 me. Come okay. on. It's still running. There we go. Okay. Same number. 36,984 Grand Stream phones found on the public internet. 20 you, seconds to run the damn you, test. They're all you want a list and start working? <laughs> Yay! Come on! <laughs> this is why you change passwords. This is why you change names. This is why you hide things behind, at least Nat, if nothing else. But I mean, come on. Nat's not going to save any of these. Okay, some of them, I can do a search in Atlanta in here, and then we'd find out how many of them are here in town. Uh, anybody? Don't knock on people's doors. That's we got Czech, we got US, we got Italy, we got, what else have we got in there? It's awesome. Okay, top See? US countries off to the left. Yes. United, States. United States. Colombia, Canada, Finland, Argentina. Thank you. Argentina, you hear that, Flavio? <laughs> oh, he's, oh, you're Brazil, ah. wait a minute. Look for Brazil. <laughs> Texas, good one. Tapai, San Jose, I mean... It tells you the carrier, it tells you the IP address, it tells you all sorts of fun stuff. Anybody want to go to work? <laughs>